Hey there, Bruce, and welcome back to Remember Eleven, Age of Infinity. Let's carry on from where we left off, shall we? I had a dream. To me, who had lost all sense of time, the dream felt like it lasted forever. Or was it just for a moment? There was no light. I couldn't see anything. I could only hear a pleasant, steady pulse, like an unborn child floating in the amniotic fluid, wrapped up in a calming and safe warmth. It felt as if all my sins had been forgiven. All the anxiety and horror within me melted and slowly diffused into the amniotic fluid, disappearing without a trace. I let my body go with the flow as I drowned in the ever-present warmth and lost myself in ecstasy. Here it felt like I was the only, absolute and all-powerful existence. I was at the centre of the universe. I didn't want to think about anything else anymore. I just wanted to stay like this forever. I didn't care if it was just a dream. Even if it was just a tranquil illusion. It was one which I preferred to that horrible reality. But a dream will never be more than a dream. Which one must eventually take form. And without any warning, that moment of awakening came violently. I was forcibly dragged back into reality, bursting out of the empty space. Without enough time to give even a baby's first cry, I was born into a new world. Where is this? In front of me was a small square glass window. The open palm of my right hand was pressed tight against the glass. I lowered my palm from the window. A palm print remained clearly visible on its cloudy white surface. I wiped it off with my sleeve and a familiar image appeared. Me. It's me. I felt dazed. My head was cloudy. However, I could clearly understand why the image reflected in that window pane was my own. It was the same face I'd had for 20 years now. There's no way I could be mistaken. As soon as I realized that, the haze in my head immediately disappeared. I looked down, checked my clothes, looked at my palms, and stared at the back of my hands for a few moments. The fingers of both hands traced the contours of my, tr of my face, felt the texture of my skin, and ran through my hair, checking its length on their way through. I sprang up and down. There were dull pains in my neck and hip, but it wasn't all that bad compared to the pain I'd felt before. I stretched my arms out as wide as I can. I take a series of deep breaths and start speaking out loud. I see. So it was all a dream. Even though it was just a dream, I somehow felt really happy to be back in my own body again. I cast another glance at my reflection and then turned my head. Ah. Before me were the figures of an unfamiliar man and woman. The words I had blurted in surprise hung in the silent air. I silently felt very awkward and gave a slight shrug. The source of the awkwardness was the words that had come out of my mouth earlier. I didn't stop to think that I not, might not be the only person in the room. Uh, um... Mumbling these meaningless words, I tried fruitlessly to relieve the tension of the moment, while at the same time attempting to analyse the situation I found myself in. First of all, where am I? As I look around, I could see that everything, including the roof, the floor, the walls, were made out of wood. From where I stood, I could see a double bunk bed to the right and a doorway to the left. Near the wall across the room stood a wooden table, along with a few simple chairs made from chopped logs. By the wall beside me was a rustic stove made out of old oil barrels. I could hear a crackling sound, most probably produced by the red-hot logs burning inside the stove. Cumulus clouds of white steam rose from the tin kettle placed upon the stove. Considering how large the double bunk bed was, the floor of the room would have probably fit 12 tatami mats. It may have actually been one of one tatami larger, but the room Im embedded in the wall was so tiny it made the room feel rather cramped. A mountain hut? I couldn't think of any other possibilities. I looked out the window to make sure. There was only the featureless, depthless darkness spread out as far as the eye could see. There wasn't anything that could prove, provide me with a clue. It wasn't that I couldn't see anything. Snow. My eyes were searching the scenery for more clues. But all they could see was the power, powdery snow, dancing violently in the frozen darkness like pamp pampas grass in the wind. Crystals of ice decorated the edges of the windows. These scant clues didn't give me any idea of where we were, but this was definitely no southern island paradise. Then it hit me. The cold. And it wasn't just your average cold. My body was freezing to its core, enough to make me want to hug the barrel stove beside me. Hey, what's wrong? The voice made me turn around. The man looked worried as he watched over me. You alright? I'm alright. Wasn't something I could honestly say. Being suddenly seized by this freezing cold with two completely unfamiliar people in front of me. Just who were these people? Oh, that was cool. Parallax. The man in front of me wore a hooded jacket. 
His short trimmed hair had casually fallen into disorder. There was a sparse amount of stubble growing around his mouth and chin, and his prominent cheekbones gave him a dauntless appearance. His body was in good shape. His figure was trim. That being said, by no means was he thin. The muscles on his shoulders and chest were toned to the degree that their contours were visible through his clothes. If anyone asked me, I'd have to say that he had an extremely manly strong body. In contrast to this air of strength that his body gave off, his eyes seemed to be doing a poor job of hiding his overwhelming sadness. The woman was crouching in front of the stove, wrapped in many layers of blankets like an empress in her robes. Her hands grasped a steel cup. Her eyes were not on me, but staring aimlessly at the contents of the cup. However, it didn't seem as if she were avoiding eye contact intentionally. Her garments were covered by the blankets, so I couldn't tell what she was wearing underneath. I could only see her dark brown high heels. The shoes weren't well suited for a place like this, and her shoes weren't all that looked out of place. The woman with her hair in an up to gave off an air of calm sophistication. Would it be an exaggeration to say she was from high society? Surrounded by the drum stove, the tin kettle and the assorted timber, her appearance was particularly conspicuous. Man, I love that parallax scrolling. The man looked as if he was in his mid-thirties, while the woman appeared to be in her late twenties. Of course, that was just my estimate. They could have been younger. Anyway, I thought it was clear that both of them were older than me. First off, I... Should I save? I suppose I should save. <laughs> as I've been doing, you know. Um, let's talk to the man. He seems a bit more talkative. Try talking to the man. Um, excuse me. Where are we? On a mountain. Mountain? Yes, a snowy mountain in midwinter. He answered somewhat casually. There should be more to it than that, right? Yeah, you're right. This might be the Tahoku region. He stroked his stubble. I held myself tighter as I trembled from the cold and meekly stepped toward the stove. Could it be that you don't know? You don't know where we are? You're right, I don't know. I was hoping you'd be able to tell me. What do you mean by that? There's no way I could possibly figure out where we were. I just waited for him to go on. More importantly, are you alright? What do you mean? No, uh, how should I say this? What I'm about to say may be a bit rude, but you... He raised on his eyebrows, drawing my eye momentarily before continuing. You're acting kind of strange. Huh? Don't be mad, okay? A while ago you were saying all kinds of weird things. All of a sudden he started spouting nonsense, acting violently, screaming and pa pausing for a long time while speaking. And now you're all gentle and everything. Well, with the shock from what happened, it wouldn't be surprising if he suffered a, de a decent amount of mental damage, but... A shock? Yeah. From the airplane crash? Crash. Did I already forget what happened up until now? Reality and dreams are completely mixed up in my head as I tried to hard to make sense of things. So that must... That means the building and the people I saw before must have been part of a dream. Then the crash. What happened to the other passengers? Was Uni saved? Though I couldn't be sure and felt a tinge of uneasiness for some reason. I wasn't really all that worried. Though I was still in a rather strange state of mind, I was definitely much calmer than the me in the dream. There was a mysterious feeling of confidence in me. A feeling that Uni was definitely alive somewhere. So it is as I thought. You don't remember the crash, do you? No, I don't think that it's that. I remember it. Everything. I replied immediately. Surprised, he tilted his head. You do remember? Really? Yes. But earlier you... Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Anyway, have a seat. Do you want me to get you something warm to drink? You were unconscious for a long time. Your throat is probably dry. He went over to the table and picked up a steel cup. With one hand, he gestured for me to take a seat. I passed behind the woman who was wrapped up in the blankets and sat down at the table with my back to the wall. Um, just what exactly did you mean? What did I mean about what? The man stood near the stove. He grabbed the tin kettle and poured some hot water into the cup. You said that I was acting oddly, didn't you? Yeah, I said that. It's the truth, after all. That's not quite what I meant. I'd like to know if there's any reason for it. A reason, huh? I can try to explain. But first of all, drink up. He placed the cup in front of me. I took a peek inside the cup and saw a reddish-orange liquid swaying lazily within. What's in this? It's chamomile tea. I found it down in the storeroom, though, so I can't guarantee it'll be fresh. He glanced briefly at the corner of the room. There was an open rectangular latch. The hole was right next to the door. There was a ladder there. I couldn't see inside from here, but that was most likely the storeroom right below us. Chamomile has a tranquilizing effect. I see, so in other words, it'll calm me down. Well, something like that. 
I wasn't particularly agitated or excited at anything, but it was true that my throat was dry, so there was no reason to refuse the offer. Just as he'd suggested, I brought my cup, the cup to my lips. Hot, 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 but it's kind of good. A refreshingly gentle aroma, similar to that of green apple, tickled my nose. The hot liquid made its way down my throat, gently warming me to the core of my body. I'm alive again, would be the expression that described the way I felt best. That's good. Hmm? That smile of yours. It's the first time I've seen you smile. Now that you mention it, my face did feel like I was smiling. It was a little embarrassing. The steam rising from the cup slipped into my nose as I started talking. Now that you think they think about it, you still haven't told me your name yet, have you? Name? Yeah, your name. He sat down at the table across from me. Oh man, here we go again. Didn't I tell you my name just now? Just now? Just now? When exactly was just now? I have no idea. I guess it wouldn't be impossible for you to forget. He did seem pretty upset. I didn't know what he meant by that. What in the world was he talking about? As I struggled to wrap my head around what he had said, the man reached into his jacket pocket and took out a pack of cigarettes along with a silver lighter. He tapped a cigarette out of the pack and placed it in his mouth. He handed the light, handled the lighter incredibly naturally, snapping it open with ease. After the crisp metallic sound faded, a red flame softly flickered into being, carrying the flame close to the tip of the cigarette. <sighs> he exhaled in a puff of purple smoke. Yamogi Seiji. Nice to meet you. He placed the cigarette in his left hand and extended the other to me in greeting. I gladly shook it. His palm was so thick and rugged, it was as if it was made of rock. And then... Huh? Suddenly a loud noise. Acting on instinct, I pulled my hand back defensively. Hey, what happened? You alright? The man who had introduced himself as Yamoki shouted into the corner of the room. There in the corner was a square hole I had just seen a few moments ago. Yeah, I'm alright. My hand just slipped a little, that's all. A voice could be heard coming from inside the hole. A familiar voice. It couldn't be. I shut up from my seat. What's the matter? Are you having another one of your episodes? I didn't have time to answer. Before I could even think, my body had sprung into action. Clinging to the ladder, I glided down along it, descending to the basement. Uni? My premonition had been right, as I thought Uni was alive. He looked at me vacantly. Dozens of logs for the stove were scattered at his feet. What's wrong? He asked with a surprisingly calm face. I slowly moved toward him. I stopped in front of him. Standing stiff as a rod, he looked up at me. Kokoron? Are you Kokoron? His pupils widened as he blinked, muttering those words. Uni! You remembered me. Of course I do. There's no way I could forget. Filled with joy, I embraced him tightly without a second thought. Wait. They might break like this. Saying that, Uni slowly removed his glasses. He placed his glasses on the shelf and then... Kokoron! Suddenly, with a voice as lovely as a girl's, he leapt into my arms. I missed you. I missed you so much, Kokoron. Uni aimlessly groped at my back. He rubbed his face against me, snuffling like a spoiled child. I corroded him closely in return. With all the strength in my arms, I squeezed him tighter and tighter. This is the second time I've been reunited with this boy. But unlike the Uni from my dream, this one wasn't cold-hearted at all. Uni had recognized me as myself. He greeted me as myself and confirmed me as myself. Just that was enough to make me feel very happy. Kokoron, I have something I need to say. What is it? Thank you for saving me. Oh, you don't have to thank me. I didn't do anything at all. Yes, I couldn't do anything at the time. I had only fastened his seatbelt and taken his hand in mine. If there was anyone to thank for our rescue, it could only be God. Rather than fate, it seemed more appropriate to call this a miracle from God. But still, thank you. I clung to Uni's body as though I'd never let him go. I put his head under my nose and filled my lungs with his scent. We're alive. The smell of his hair, the burning warmth of his skin. Alive, alive, over and over again, I repeated it in my mind. I trembled in joy as I stood witness to this miracle. After a while, I realized that my cheeks were wet. The small drops clinging to my lips were warmer than the chamomile tea I just drunk. We stayed in our embrace for quite a while, long enough to lose track of time. Right then, my mind was completely void of the memories from my strange dream with its grotesque script and frighteningly detailed scenery. But still, there was one thing bothering me. I'm gonna save again. Sorry I keep interrupting the flow with this shit. But you know, we gotta get to the true ending sometime. What you need to say to bothered me? What's that? 
Let's just go with the first one. Why was uni in a place like this? It bothered me, but, well, it felt rather trifling and insignificant. He was safe. That was all that mattered now. With the end of the long hug nowhere in sight, the small doubt that had sprouted in the corner of my mind slowly faded away. I forgot everything, becoming intoxicated with warmth, as I continued to soak in the happiness of our reunion. I'm left-handed. When I use a pen, chopsticks or scissors, I always hold them in my left hand. That's why I wear my watch on my non-dominant right wrist. That's because if I wore it on my left wrist, it would interfere with a variety of things. Of course, it's on my right wrist even now. It was a wristwatch I'd fancied and bought just the other day. The analog dial indicated that it was 9.37. The animus within the anima. The inside of the room was developed by the sad cry of the wind wail enveloped by the sad cry of the wind wailing outside. Other than that, besides the lid of the kettle rattling, not a sound could be heard. Not a single person opened their mouth. The heavy silence persisted. The cup placed in front of me was already empty. The chamomile tea had truly warmed the body and calmed my heart. I'd also gotten used to the feeling of sitting on hard wooden logs. I put my back up against the wall and observed the others. Uni was sitting on the bunk bed, dangling his legs. His face showed boredom. But even like this, he was far more energetic than the uni from my dream. Yumogi had fixed his gaze on the window, observing the conditions outside. Smoke was slowly rising from his cigarette he'd held leisurely between his middle and index fingers. The woman, who was wrapped in numerous blankets, hadn't moved an inch from her spot in front of the stove. She flicked a stray lock of hair behind her ear. There was a lovely elegance to her actions, which, even though I was a woman, drew my eyes with its coquettish charm. Even after being thrown here in such a disordered state, she still took great care in keeping herself proper, from the angle of her fingers to the tilt of her neck. There were four of us inside the cabin, including myself. There was also one thing that all four of us had in common, and that was we were all unhurt. Of course, we could probably f easily find one or two scratches or bruises on our bodies. However, no one had serious injuries. Our bones were fine and our insides seemed to be in place. It's not like I asked anyone directly, but that much is obvious from observing the people around me. I don't remember a single thing about the crash, but I do know that the shock from it had, had to be tremendous. Yet here we are, here we are, alive and well. As I thought about it, I couldn't help but think of the word miracle as well. Miracle. I wonder what it was that we were all alive here like this. The room didn't have any electric lighting. Only the light of the lantern served to illuminate the hopeless air around us. The flame within it wavered, causing the shadows in the room to dance and sway along with it. Somehow it was a very illusory scene. Enchanted by the dubious flicker of the flame, I began to lose sight of the boundary between reality and fantasy. If the silence continued, I felt like it would once again be consumed by that bizarre dream world. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it is. So somebody say something. So resolved, I decided to first... Here we go again. Talk to Uni. Hey Uni? Yeah? The four of us the only ones here, right? Yeah, I guess. Then the other passengers? Uni's face darkened. The room had become shrouded in silence once again. Once again, Uni looked down for a second, then back up again, opening his mouth. You see, that's... I'll take it from there. Yumogi cut into the conversation. That's right. Yumogi takes a puff on a cigarette. Now that you mention it, there's something we have to talk about. Yukido-san? Yukido? Did I hear him wrong? An unfamiliar name suddenly entered my ears. Yumogi left the window and made his way to the centre of the room. He took a square box from the shelf beside the bed. You want some more tea? This might take a while. He prepared the chamomile tea while holding his cigarette between his lips. He poured us some tea. He put out the cigarette in the ashtray sitting on the table and then sat down in front of me. Well then, where should I start? How far back can you remember, Yukido-san? I'm pretty sure I can recall you saying I remember everything about the crash. Again. Again he uses a name I've never heard before. What's wrong? Why are you frowning like that? I straightened my posture and began to talk, looking intently at him. Before we get into that, can I ask you something? What is it? Who is this Yukido? Who you say? But that's... Your name. I was astonished. Sighing deeply, I could feel myself starting to shake. Why? Why were things like this happening one after another? I can't exactly say I was why I was angry, but there was no way I could just bite, gonna bite my tongue. I raised my voice in protest. My name is Fuyukawa Kokoro, okay? Really, I wonder how many times I'd have to repeat myself like this. I'm tired of it already. 
Although the other times I said that phrase had been inside that dream. Huh? Fuyu Kawakokoro. That's right, Fuyu Kawakokoro. Should I show you my student ID card or would my driver's license please you better? For that matter, how about you go down to my local ward office right now so you can see an official copy of my family registry? No, sorry. Seems somehow I've made you angry. But originally, the one who brought up the name Yukido was you, so... Yumogi hesitated to speak. His gaze wavered around the room as he rubbed the stubble on his chin. Well, whatever. It's probably true if you say so. Not probably, it is true. Fine, fine, I got it already. Your name's Fuyu Kawakokoro, right? Yes. I clearly asserted, and then... Wait. Just wait a second. The woman who had persistently preserved her silence until now finally opens her mouth. Throwing off her blanket, she delicately stands up and walks purposefully toward me. You, just what is your deal? She slams both hands on the table. Bending forward, she brings her face up to mine. Her entire body gives off a ghastly aura, filling me with dread. My name is Fuyu Kawakokoro. Then why'd you say it was Yukido before? I don't know what she's angry about, but the dreadful expression on her face leaves me unable to reply. Answer me, you. Just what are you plotting? Plotting, now that's a word I remember hearing. Somehow it feels almost like a reenactment of my dream. Saying I'm Fuyu Kawakokoro and having somebody get angry because of that, it did rather resemble the dream. Then what was the dream supposed to be some kind of premonition? Hey, you listening? I'm talking to you. I I'm listening, really. <laughs> Your attitude sure has changed from before, hasn't it? Before, before, before. When they say before, just what do these people mean? Well, I'll ask you one more time. Why do you say something so stupid? Something so stupid? Don't pretend like you don't know. Obviously, when you were trying to trick us by saying you were Yukido Satoru. J just who is that person? Stop with that lousy act already. Act, act, act. Even though I'm not acting? Now, now, calm down, Mayuzumi. You're scaring Fu Fuyukawa-san. Hmm? What'd you just say? Mayuzumi? You just called me Mayuzumi, didn't you? Stop addressing me as if you I were your pal. Just who do you think you are? Well then, what should I call you? Lin-chan, maybe? You're making fun of me, you unshaven old bastard. Being referred to with Chan is something I hate most in the world. Then what is the thing you hate second most? People I don't know calling me my last name, with no honorifics at all. Then, what would number three be? Number three is, let's see, being called by the wrong name, maybe. Like being called Su Suzu instead of Lin, or being called Kaoru instead of Mayazumi. Now that you mention it, one time I got a direct mail addressed to someone named Tonbi, written the same as Black Kite. Why did it arrive at my house? I wish people wouldn't suddenly decide I'm some bird of prey. <laughs> Do you hear that? Tonbi, she said, I'd sure, it'd sure suit you to be reborn as a falcon, wouldn't it? Shut up, brats like you should just get lost, brat. Well, what's wrong with you? I was just joking around. What, got a problem? <laughs> this is why grannies are trouble. Uni had probably gotten angry, as he deliberately muttered that phrase at a volume just loud enough for it to be heard. G -g granny Where do you get off calling a lovely young maiden of 23 a granny? A granny! I called you a granny because you're a granny, a senile old hag. You bastard. Look, you got crow's feet all around your eyes, don't you, Toby Lin Chan? You damn brat, you want to go up, do you? As if. Who'd want to start a fight with an old lady like you? Ah, now you've done it. I wonder if I should just roll you up in a mat and throw you outside. Try it if you can, you persimmon gobbling old hag. <laughs> You've got it, you four-eyed seeing enemy. Come on, cut it out, you two. You mogi sick of watching their back and forth, decide to interfere and push the two apart. You haven't forgotten where we are, have you? What are you going to do if you waste all your strength on a pointless squabble like this? But, no buts. If you carry on with this nonsense, you'll be sleeping in the storeroom, are we clear? Yumogi lectured them in a surprisingly dignified tone. The two exchanged sharp glances, but restrained themselves from taking any further actions. Even those two couldn't do anything, with Yumogi standing like a mountain between them. Neither really backing down, Yuni and the woman both looked away and returned their respective, to their respective territories. <sighs> really now? Yumogi sighed as he placed his hand on his hip. Before we knew it, we'd lost track of our conversation, and the target of the woman's anger had completely changed. I was certainly glad to have gotten out of further questioning, but... Anyway, I was able to at least establish the woman's name, Mayazumi Lin. Like a cat about to flee after a fight, she opened her mouth and let out a last parting complaint. Her personality was almost the complete opposite of what I'd imagined it would be based on her mature looks and graceful bearing. The image of her I'd had in my mind just a few moments ago had either been thoroughly, 
had to be had been thoroughly revised. The woman had a rude, harsh, and uninhibited personality. By the way, Mayazumi's questioning, though it had been brief, had implanted a lingering feeling of uneasiness in the corner of my mind. It's about Yukido Satoru. Why was I mistaken for this Yukido person, whom I've never met before and know nothing about? First of all, just who is Yukido Satoru? That and the words both Yamoki and Mayazumi had said bothered me. A while ago, you were saying all kinds of weird things. Then why'd you say it was Yukido before? Didn't I tell you my name just now? <laughs> Your attitude sure has changed from before, hasn't it? Before. Replaying it all in my head, I finally arrived at an answer. Based on what they'd said, only one conclusion could be reached. No, something like that wasn't possible. I denied my own thoughts immediately. It was something I couldn't believe. I didn't want to believe. The conclusion I'd reached was simply too unreal to accept. That's why I turned away from it. I didn't want to think about it any further. That you and someone else had swapped bodies temporarily. And that somebody else was the one that you were in the dream world of. But it wasn't a dream world, it was a real world where you were some... You know what I mean. I am me, Fuyukawa Kokoro. I'm no one else but me. Struggling to suppress my wild thoughts, I tried to convince myself of this. It was around 10pm, a large heap of blankets in hand, Mayazumi climbed up onto the top bunk. Now there was a woman, lying with her back towards us in more ways than one. The kind of person that would stay in bed just to show everyone just how much she detested their company. I wasn't sure if she was really sleeping or not. She may have just had her eyes closed. In any case, without so much as a sorry or a good night, this woman shut herself away in her own little world. Naturally, there wasn't anyone who bothered to ask her what she was up to. To tell the truth, I myself was a little relieved that the troublesome one had decided to settle down. Well then, shall we begin? As if prudently choosing his timing, Yamogi quietly opened his mouth. There's something I'd like to say before I begin. Please don't lose heart. There's still hope. He carefully chose his words as he continued solemnly. Flight HAL-18. That was the name of the small passenger aircraft we boarded. The plane was carrying a total of 31 passengers and crew members on a non-stop journey to Waikanae, one of the chain of islands on the north of Japan. If flight conditions were favourable, we should have arrived at the airport at 5pm, but... But we didn't. <laughs> January 11th, 2011, 4.08pm. Flight HAL-18 crashed deep in the snowy mountains. I, who had regained consciousness after being thrown out of the plane, began my search and rescue efforts for survivors. A snowstorm was raging all around. Sunset was drawing near and I could barely see my past, past my nose. Still, I didn't give up. The fact that I was alright meant that there had to be other survivors as well, I thought. It was not a feeling or of obligation or a sense of justice which kept me going. I was spurred on by some unexplainable instinct. Before long, I found two women among the scattered rubble. Mayazumi Lin and you. Having lost con consciousness from the shock of the crash, you were laying beneath the caved-in ceiling, your head hanging limp. Even when I shook you by the shoulders and slapped your cheeks, you showed no sign of coming to. Mayazumi, on the ha other hand, was conscious. She'd stood on her own, mumbling something deliriously and started aimlessly walking into the downpour of snow on her unsteady feet. The girl had most likely lost at least some of her sanity to the shock of the crash. Even when I called for her to stop, my voice didn't seem to reach her ears. Somehow I was able to catch her, and my very next thought was that I should find some shelter from the wind. What I found was a section of the air airframe severed at the front and back. The outer wall burned black, unshapely exposed. It resembled the decaying corpse of a monster. Pulling Mayazumi by the hand and carrying her over my you over my shoulder, I entered the carcass seeking refuge. Inside, a foul stench filled the air. I suddenly realized that the smell was that of burning meat. There were chunks of charred flesh firmly stuck firmly to the seats which had been fixed to the floor. Dead bodies were still seated with their heads against the backs of the seats in front of them. Some of the bodies were missing everything from the seatbelt down. There were bloodstains, scraps of flesh and entrails splattered against the windows. There was one corpse that seemed comparatively unharmed as it stayed motionless, frozen solid like a plaster sculpture. The only word that could describe the disastrous scene was hell. Having taken it all in, Mayazumi looked absent-mindedly and dazed. He was still unconscious so he didn't react at all. However, a single sigh escaped your lips, which made me believe you'd surely get better with time. Your body temperature, however, was nearly that of a corpse. That made sense. You were wearing the same clothes you'd boarded the plane in. Of course, you weren't the only one with this problem. Mayazumi was the same. 
She was wearing a suit and high heels, and her legs were only covered with a thin pair of stockings. Left like that, the two of you would surely have died. With this in mind, I looked through the melted baggage compartments in the ceiling of the plane in hopes of finding something useful among the luggage. I grabbed the bags that looked like they might have something helpful inside and pulled them down. I found a down jacket and a fur coat, a wool sweater, a muffler, and some gloves. I got together as many clothes like that as I could find and dressed you two in them. At the time I'd finished, the sun had disappeared behind the horizon. But the light of the moon and the stars eaten up by the clouds and the snow, near perfect darkness enveloped us. I found a flashlight near the flight's attendant seat. I turned it on and a streak of light pierced the darkness. There were only two things to be done next. First I had to make a shelter, by closing off the open ends of the short, shorn airframe. Second, I had to find some means of communication and send out a distress signal. I didn't spare a thought for anything else. There might have been people still alive somewhere in the snowfield. However, the small pieces of wreckage that had been scattered over a large area, which would have made further searching nearly impossible. And what about making our way down the mountain? In this state of affairs, that took precedence over everything else. As a mountaineer, I knew how terrifying and treacherous the snowy mountains could be. To start marching randomly inside a snowstorm was reckless at best. I didn't have a clue as to where we were. I didn't even know which way it was to base, so I couldn't think about descending the mountain. Our options were very limited. We spent all night in Bivouac, with nothing else to do but wait for the weather conditions to improve. If they got better, a military or rescue helicopter would have no trouble finding us. Of course, that'd be pointless if the three of us had lost our lives before they arrived. That's why, to live, that was the highest priority for us. I immediately got to work. I used the gathered up luggage and blankets and such to stuff the gaping holes in the airframe. The day had come to an end and the temperature started falling. It felt like it would soon get so cold that your breath would freeze instantly. I'd lost all feeling in my fingers, yet I continued working silently. However, as I was covering up one of the holes, I noticed something. My Yazumi was gone. No matter where I looked, she was nowhere to be seen. I rushed outside. Thick snowflakes began to fall and cling to me in layers, as if they'd been eagerly waiting for their chance. I bent double to avoid this attack, pulling my hood close over my eyes, and beginning search, began searching in the darkness. The piled up snow beneath my feet was immeasurably deep, but thanks to that I could see the trail broken by my Yumi's rustling through. With the torch in hand, I turned to find more traces. I could barely see a thing. In the middle of the snowstorm at night, the light of a pocket flashlight was almost useless. And if I tried calling out at the top of my lungs, the roaring of the wind would effort effortlessly drown out my voice. I couldn't waste another moment if I wanted to find her. As the traces that she had left behind were quickly being filled with snow, I jumped into the snow. My body began to move without a second thought. I pushed on, parting the falling snow before me. Blinded by the myriad of snowflakes, I single-mindedly continued to pursue her trail. After marching on for ten minutes, I finally killed a glimpse of her. She had collapsed face down in the middle of a large snowfield. I had no idea why she would do something so foolish. Losing her cool and giving in to panic, she may have thought it doesn't matter where I go. I just need to get away. Anyway, she'd made her way here and probably collapsed from exhaustion. I brought my ear closer to her mouth and I could hear her breathing, just barely. I quickly put her on, on my back and started making my way along the path I'd made coming here. Even if it was only the body of a single light woman, trying to rustle through while carrying a person on my back was unthinkably difficult. Our path was hindered by the now hip deep snow. It had become virtually impossible to take another step forward. And when we stood still, the snow blowing up against us from the ground was mercilessly robbing us of our body heat. My limbs had become completely numb. My fingertips, if I could feel them, would probably feel like pieces of thick solid wire. We pushed on and on, but the surrounding landscape didn't show any sign of change. No matter where we went, the darkness spread endlessly throughout the space around us like a curse. Before long, I lost sight of the path. The markers I had left behind had become buried by the snow and were indiscernible. My legs had become completely stuck. I couldn't take a single step further. So this is it. I knelt down on the snow. I knew this had happened from the moment I set out. If you walk out into a snowstorm, it's only natural for you to lose your way. But even then, I never once thought of turning back. Why is that? It might have been that bringing back my Izumi was just an excuse, when in reality, I just wanted to meet my end here. It's too late. Too late. No matter where I looked, the desolate, barren plain was dyed the colour of death. This world ruled by despair and emptiness was rejecting my life, and the act of breathing was regarded by it as a sin. The sharp pain running through my entire body was a sure testament to that. With my Azumi still on my back, I collapsed in the middle of the snowfield. Sorry for the long wait. 
Now I can finally join you. Dad. Dad. Right then I thought I heard a voice. A voice I had heard so often, but now thought I'd never hear again. Dad. Dad. I knew it had to be an illusion. Faced with my death, my consciousness is breaking down. It felt like it was a voice of a spirit come to haunt me. Or if I couldn't help but try to confirm it. Having gathered the remainder of my strength, I strained my throat and raised my nearly frozen body to its unsteady feet. Junichi. Junichi, is that you? Alright, we need to wrap this one up here because we're out of time for this episode. But, uh... I'm curious to see where this goes. Obviously, it seems like we're swapping bodies with that other person, Satoru. But, um, who was in that other world, but maybe that other world's in the future or a different timeline. I don't fucking know. It's a bit early to start speculating, I think. But this guy, this Yamogi guy, seems like the bomb, man. He's, he's, he's my boy. Anyway, thanks for watching, Bruce, and I'll see you in the next one.